Well, thank you all for joining us. I have prepared for uh, prepared a few questions. Let's have an icebreaker first. Well, for the future digital world, what is your outlook or uh, understanding, or what's your guess? How it's going to be like? Uh, what type of applications, scenarios, and what values does it bring to us by that time? And which are the big areas that we need the further breakthroughs in technology or product or market or ecosystems? Let's go through this question one by one. Okay, thank you for uh, asking this question. Future digital world, this is a pretty big topic. And I would like to focus on some of my uh, personal experiences or within my industries, I think well, digital world uh, itself is partially connected with metaverse. And digital world is more paralleled, digitalized the world of the realistic one. And uh, coming to product, I believe I can think of uh, a few things. For example, in the traditional shopping uh, industry, a digital world can digitalize your shopping scenario and there could be some application scenarios for example digitalizing the real world assets that's a big application there nft is another one digital collectibles and then uh, also uh, in entertainment including games industry it's another application scenario like traditionally it's probably uh, in a very large scale production in those scenarios and it's going to be different in the future including like traditional mmo and then above that uh, even bigger more larger scale more people are going to join it and apart from that i could also think of uh, as now after the covid and the lockdowns and we rare get uh, actually gather offline and it reminds me that some online concerts could also be organized and there could be some uh, scenarios like that in a digital world in the future and the uh, rest the traditional tourism and the cultural industries could also do quite a lot of digitalization as well because people now have less chance to go out also due to COVID. And then those uh, tourism shops or libraries, they are digitalizing their scenarios and their uh, services and uh, products for people to enjoy them online. So technology-wise, there are some similarities across those ones. AR and VR scenarios are getting better in technology involvement. We can have more indulging uh, experiences. AR, VR, XR scenarios are getting more mature in technology and allowing people to have better user experiences or even completely change the current experience. And for us who are working in this industry, I come from Ali Cloud and cloud gaming uh, platform. Our cloud gaming uh, technical scenario also provides some computation support and the, the rendering technologies and abilities so that we can shift the computation or rendering process onto the cloud. I believe this is one of the directions. Uh, so first of all, I want to thank uh, Dr. Shi for the opportunity of the sharing. Uh, maybe I can share a little bit about uh, our thoughts on digitalization. Uh, actually, Mr. Lee uh, talked a lot about uh, the things and he clarified a lot. So there's AR, uh, uh, MR, XR, so we do see the application of those technologies in gaming and in like uh, movies. The outcome was pretty good. Maybe in the next phase we will try to do more augmented reality and maybe uh, MR in the future. I think there is a lot of room for imagination. 
Apart from entertainment, uh, the remote office or home office or remote uh, video conferencing, of course, the effect is not as good as face-to-face. -face. But if we can use those technologies well, I think it also helps the improvement of the productivity. I think a new technology is not just about entertainment. Of course, entertainment is important. Gaming and video and the movies, those are very important for personal experience. But good technology should be able to, uh, you know, push the productivity forward. It will not just stay at the individual experience level. So in the future, when we do digitalization, we can think more about this because. Personally, I am uh, more talking on the chip uh, from the chip perspective. Technically, we are always evolving. VR as a concept, uh, we're already at the peak like uh, in 2016 or 17, there were a lot of VR companies. But the experience is not as good as people think, so uh, it's not that hard then and now it's uh, back to the center of the stage. So it's a process of a new technology to transform into something that can be really applied in the market. So there are expectations or forecasts on the scale of VR in 2025, and also I've been uh, following the MR technology uh, from Apple. So it's got it got delayed and delayed. For Apple, they uh, basically balanced the technology and experience pretty well. So maybe when that product is released, there may be a new wave. So now for the uh, AR and MR, maybe some are some products can reach the uh, sales level of like 10 million, but uh, others are struggling catching up. From the chip perspective, now for the VR devices, basically, mostly they used XR2 chip from Qualcomm in respect of the experience. Of course, it can still cause some uh, dizziness, but when X3 comes out, uh, recently we've been talking about this, so X3, it supports uh, lower latency, you can uh, support uh, you know, 4K in both eyes, and maybe in individual experience, it can do better. So from the technical perspective, I never doubted that. Maybe we cannot do it in 2024, but still we can do it maybe in 2025. It's just a matter of time. But from another perspective, for the sensory changes, recently I think Qualcomm said that for XR2, latency is already as low as uh, 16 milliseconds. Normally we say below 20 milliseconds, people would not get dizzy, but still people get dizzy. So that means human body sometimes uh, reacts to this kind of uh, inconsistency of the eye and movement. So we need to explore more, not just on the paper. Because the senses of people, senses of human is involved. We need to incorporate a lot of things. So I think this is an important direction. It's not just about technology. Thank you. Dennis? So I couldn't agree more. Actually. Uh, the future digital world in my eyes, uh, before any physical laws get broken, normally it will just go alongside uh, the route that we uh, already expected. So things will get faster and faster, and uh, we will realize things that we cannot realize right now. For example, if uh, Moore's law doesn't work, then there will be another law, and uh, the computing power will go further. And for viewer glasses, if we think it's not realistic, maybe when 
the computing power is enough, it will get more realistic. In five or ten years, the digital world will be more similar to the real world until there's some uh, breakthrough in physics, maybe in quantum physics or other areas. And then we will see a revolution. Maybe that will not occur in like 20, 30 years time. So for the digital world, I think uh, that is the direction. The biggest difficulty is the hardware limit or chip. So the experts talked from different perspectives. I think Hao Chen talked about application from production to uh, living to the productivity to entertainment. And uh, Mr. Tan talked about the uh, flaws of the chips and also uh, mentioned that VR is an important interface for uh, HMI. And then uh, Mr. Cao, uh, who had always been in, in AR VR uh, since the last wave of VR, uh, I think maybe Ta Mr. Cao has uh, some other thoughts. Please. The voice is a bit low. Can you hear me? Yeah. So, yeah, due to the COVID, I cannot come to Shanghai. So just uh, follow up on the topic. Since uh, I've been in the industry for many years, and uh, I think the future digital world, uh, in respect of the senses, from looking uh, to interacting, that is a kind of iteration. So in 2014, Oculus solved the problem of seeing, uh, although there's dizziness, maybe uh, within 20 milliseconds, it will not bring dizziness to the eye, but still uh, the, the uh, coordination between eye and body, uh, it, it can still create some problem there. So the interaction is already better. So I think in the future, we need to solve the problem of simulation. Uh, like uh, in the past, we solved the problem of seeing. Now we need to solve the problem of interaction. So we have the gestures to the uh, joystick, to the uh, brain, computer interface, and we have the wearable devices like uh, uh, the watch or uh, other devices. But if we can have the breakthrough in senses as well as the interaction, then we can really have a realistic world. So in my view, uh, I think I've been in the industry for many years. In the future, the computing power of the chip will get better. That's one thing. The other is that from the current perspective, I think glasses is the uh, uh, best way to interact with the digital world. So in the ecosystem, AR, VR glasses are the cheapest way for people to enter the three-dimensional sensory world. And I think interaction is the limitation uh, for us to enter into the VR world. And of course, if there's a breakthrough in the physical world, of course, we don't even need the glasses, maybe. We can just use the connection to our uh, brain, like the matrix, right? But actually, it all comes down to computing. I think in the future, the XR surrounding glasses will continue to improve and new ways of interaction will continue to have breakthroughs. So with the improvement of GPU and CPU, the future uh, digital world is about the technical, the technology stack. And if we have a breakthrough in interaction, then we will get more interested in uh, interacting with the world, and then the interaction will have some breakthrough. Then we will have a big a boost of the industry. Okay, thank you. So to sum up, people think that for HMI, maybe in the future, uh, the form may change, maybe from glasses to the, uh, the brain-computer uh, interaction, but uh, uh, the processing still needs a lot of computing power.
and it simulates uh, the ways human deal with the world and uh, uh, visual information is uh, still the dominant uh, one like 70 80 percent right? and then uh, like uh, 10 20 percent is uh, uh, audio and that's easy to solve because we have GPU, we have the sound card. But then for uh, the touch or for the smell, we need other breakthroughs. But anyways, I think for 90% of the information, uh, we can simulate the visual and audio information. But now we saw the VR products uh, and they basically can deal with the scenario in the games. But if you are in VR or in other uh, segments, if you are in the digital uh, cultural entertainment, I think, of course, movie is kind of like the the benchmark. Uh, that, that's there's the benchmark, uh, the Ready Player One, and that movie. Uh, there was the novel first, then there's the movie, right? And there's a. Uh, typical uh, concept where you play a single player game it's fine because uh, the GPU uh, maybe it's a uh, 1080 or t uh, t you, you know 1080p uh, or uh, even uh, 2k or 4k so they are improved uh, always but if we have like uh, 10,000 uh, player in one screen then we have a huge number of uh, workload and that requires a lot on the chip and also on the cloud computing and for Kevin I think uh, if you are building the productivity tool or to, to build the uh, VR scenes of course it's a big challenge and also for Dennis uh, from cloud to edge there are a lot of devices the coordination among those devices we need to think about the unified standard among different devices so uh, what kind of thoughts do you have in that area maybe we can still uh, go the same order uh, so I will just talk a little bit about the, the cloud uh, I think uh, it has something to do with the uh, gaming and people always ask about us uh, when we do cloud gaming so now with the uh, uh, stronger computing power of the uh, devices what value does the game bring so actually Dr. Shi you mentioned a good question with this massive scale scene with uh, 10,000 players at the same time uh, even if we have very strong uh, computing power at the device end, can we handle that? In the future, with AR and VR, and with the uh, head-mounted devices, the problem of uh, power and uh, uh, radiation of local devices, we definitely know that the uh, rendering on the device will get limited. And for the cloud information, uh, theoretically, it's uh, infinite. With a scene of more than 10 people, uh, 10,000 players at the same time on the screen, for the number of polygons for num the number of uh, uh, gamers, you can try to scale up or scale down in the uh, data center. And the challenge is on the architecture of the GPU itself, because now for the cloud gaming, uh, normally we use the traditional GPU uh, for each core of the GPU. The computing is still like the single player game or the traditional cell phone game. But on the cloud, if it's cloud native rendering, then the GPU capability needed is more about referring to the actual uh, scene than scale up and scale down the computing power for the GPU itself and for the virtualization and the cross GPU coordination and transmission uh, there are new requirements in place and for cloud gaming or cloud rendering on some level it can help us realize 
was it seems like a Ready Player One uh, with uh, 10,000 players uh, on the same screen at the same time. Because uh, cloud capability is infinite, theoretically. But for the IDC or data center itself, uh, there can be some bottleneck in connectivity, and also it raises challenges on the architecture of the GPU. So in the future, when the GPU architecture gets evolved all the time, and also today we still didn't have the chance to mention some of the new architectures, uh, maybe we can try to virtualize when uh, there is a problem on a single core, other cores don't get uh, impacted, maybe we can provide some support on the uh, flexible scale up and scale down. Okay, uh, what's more from Mr. Tansen's uh, perspective? Well, uh, he gave a very good example from gaming because uh, downstage I already talked with him about the gaming. So uh, on the cloud, uh, they can virtualize and that's a solution that can solve a lot of problems. But the relative high latency is still there. We always mentioned this new concept, the H set. So maybe we can go from uh, device to cloud. But maybe we have the edge side devices that can provide a lot of uh, capability. And then compared to the cloud, the latency is better. And in the gaming scenario, of course, Hao Chen understands it uh, more, maybe from edge to cloud. Uh, for the gaming, uh, most of the scenarios can be satisfied, but if we really get into VR or AR, then the uh, latency is more sensitive. Then maybe on the edge side, we can deploy uh, relatively a strong uh, capability and uh, the latency is lower and then the network uh, chain is shorter. And we know that for the edge server is kind of a fast track in the industry. Technically speaking, I think it can be a viable solution. What's more, Hao Chen also mentioned that on the uh, device end, the power is an issue. So. If there's no breakthrough in the battery technology, if you want to run something with high computing requirement, maybe the process is always uh, moving forward like a uh, uh, 3 nanometer, 2 nanometer, but still, the uh, battery life of the cell phone really did improve. So when we need higher computing power, does it mean that we can connect it to like uh, uh, some other devices or on the edge side? If there's a breakthrough, maybe on the power or on the battery side, I think that is also another critical area because it's not just about, yeah, maybe we can get 4,000 um, milliamps hour or maybe it's just infinite charging in the future. Uh, I'm just throwing the ideas out there. So we can look at it from pers two perspectives. Maybe we can charge very, very fast and then that will do. Or maybe the battery, battery can be so large that you don't need to worry. So when you don't need to worry about the power, maybe it's freer. You don't have to think about a lot of other concerns. That's my thought. Well, I think it's well said. Uh, maybe we don't need to put everything on the same basket. In the same basket, maybe we can do a distributed uh, way. Maybe it's not just the data center or the cloud. Maybe it's on the edge or maybe it's on different devices. We can do the rendering or other tasks and then we can have the distribution of tasks. But I think uh, there are two follow-up issues. For example, on the device end, uh, it's about the balance of the performance and the uh, power, but maybe the power doesn't create an issue, but maybe there's another issue of heating. But maybe you can put more uh, tasks on the edge or on the cloud or on the device, then the heating problem can be a lot better, but it brings a lot of challenges technically. For example, how do we distribute the tasks? And for Mr. Cao, uh, who is in a software development tool, uh, that's a bigger challenge. So Mr. Cao, maybe you can share a little bit on that.
So I think you all mentioned about the coordination between the device and the cloud. So we are looking at it. At first, we were trying to uh, define XR, and the computing requirement is so high. So we th thought that it's kind of like a smart screen. So on the glass, and it's kind of like a smart screen. And at that time, we boldly think our strategical experts says you can use that edge mode. We also thought about it, just like the PC end with cable connections. Is it possible that in the future they have their own smart computation unit? So in terms of coordination between edge and the cloud, we are more focused on doing it in real time at the moment right now. For example, now the wireless connections between uh, the device and uh, the PC and the helmets, maybe in a LAN environment, maybe we can leverage that PC computation ability and to turn it into a family used server to solve that uh, computation limitations. And the second thing that uh, maybe we believe one reason that uh, Apple haven't joined in AR and VR you know, headsets because to wirelessly connect that and the battery technology is indeed a bottleneck. For example, some people said we can have a wireless charging, but we really wanted to have a higher energy density with battery because of, for so many years, the batteries aren't getting any substantially better. With better performances and a better CPU and the processors on uh, smartphones, our batteries just are not catching up. And another thing that we believe in the future is that within a family, we have a server which serves the entire family as the edge computation node so that the family members all can have enough access to the computation uh, power and all they have all the other devices are basically smart screens and they use wireless and uh, 5G etc to do that within that family scenario this is what we think and once we reach that the computation power can have a certain breakthrough and people can be uh, eliminated, okay, people can be liberated from the troublesomeness of that cable connections within their family scenarios. And that the next step would be the substantial breakthrough of battery technology. So in summary, we believe the FOV, which is the screen, the display technology, that's the, that's the first to be improved and the next one is battery. Okay, thank you, Mr. Tao. Dennis, could you add something on that? Yes, I'll add only one thing. Now, all of the VR glasses and the the cloud technology they support, well, they're all based upon Wi-Fi because 5G doesn't support that volume and bandwidth. Well, battery at home, it's okay because you can have a cable connection to uh, supply power but in, over, uh, in outside in mobile end you need 5G and you need a battery and both these two are currently bottlenecks all right Dennis you just mentioned about uh, the application of that in outdoor uh, scenarios which is also my next question related to that now apart from the indoor use of uh, AR VR and XR another application is in automotives Automotives are occupying a lot of people's usage times and has got more screens in them as well. So Imagination has been doing works in this regard. And could you tell us more about your understanding about future cars and speak about those uh, application scenarios? So for this question, maybe let's start from uh, Dennis. Dennis and uh, Mr. Tao. So Kelvin, could you do that first? You heard you heard my question, right? Yes. Yeah, automotive. Well, now with the electrical vehicles, its penetration getting higher. It's basically like a new pad. 
because with the uh, infotainment system and a bigger screen, we spend more time in vehicles, especially if now currently we haven't solved the problem of autonomous driving. And once we solve that, well, entertainment is going to be pretty important because it helps to kill time. And now already we have been making a lot of technical breakthroughs and we ourselves are making new breakthroughs together with uh, OEMs to have uh, automatically generated map while wearing helmet in vehicle so that you can have the real-time data of the vehicle basically to match it up with uh, a virtual world in a game so that you can well enjoy the game just like you're driving your vehicle and by that time when we achieve autonomous driving you can spend all your time on your travel and watching movies and listening to music these are the solution that we have already been able to provide or even food could be delivered to your vehicle and automotives the cars would change the way people react in the world so with all these entertainment environment, the cars, the cars would run more smoothly on vehicle as by that time because everyone has been uh, using autonomous driving and people could enjoy a much better entertainment experience in vehicle. But of course, that's going to take some time before the development of uh, AR and the VR reaches a certain degree and there are quite a lot of challenges for us to address for example the gyroscope uh, the angles of it and the, the mobility of the vehicles etc but it's for sure that people will spend a growing amount of time using entertainment in vehicles so our understanding is that the car would serve as a bigger computation unit which can provide the computation power to the user but also it provides enough computation power for entertainment and it helps to solve the problem of VR's dizziness so that with the turning and moving of the vehicle you combine it together into a game it helps you to solve that problem. And I read an article from Audi. They are doing a commercial application of that. And every OEM is now trying to work together with AR and VR, maybe AR for navigation, but VR for entertainment. And I believe the interaction between the two will grow furthermore. And every year, new cars would be bought, older cars would be uh, obsoleted, and that helps to increase the penetration rate of AR and VR devices. For example, we've been thinking about a remote aid for changing uh, tires and the maintenance through AR and VR communications, etc. The automotives is an industry which could really benefit from this technological growth and we believe it's going to be another entrance of the future digital world and the vehicles would really bring up the sales of many of these devices once we reach a certain technical uh, degree and people are going to spend more time in cars and people are going to need those digitalized vehicles even more. It's going to be uh, a process in which the technology and the applications grow respectively and interactively. And we're going to have more uh, setups for the vehicles. And of course, it's IoT related and a lot of safety related tools will be developed. And while developing those, you would find that whether the IoT is convenient and easy to use is also what we want to care about. And these APIs are connected with AR and VR, so stability and robustness could be very important as well. We've always been uh, 
strengthening how important it is to have memory management and uh, operational stabilities. That's my idea. Well, thank you, Mr. Calvin Tao. To summarize a little bit, uh, vehicles in the future is going to be like a 4D cinema. And of course, there are other safety requirements to be included as well. And Dennis, your idea? Well, I agree with uh, Mr. Calvin Tao because the automotive industry has a certain margin, profiting margin, and uh, basically the power supply is not limited in those application scenarios. So heads-up display is a great example I'd like to talk about. Within two or three years, we will see many more AR scenarios in HED and then a IVI in vehicle infotainment system. Imagination has entered this field as well. In automotive scenarios, we have a long way to go and a big space to tap into. And you, uh, Mr. Tan, well, for automotives, now we can see the electrification trend is undeniable. More vehicles are going to be using electricity instead of fossil fuel. And we can see that many Chinese OEMs and the Tesla have been leading such trend. And the changes we can see, on one hand, it's the shift towards autonomous driving. And the other thing is the infotainment system, the multiple screens, the growing number of screens in vehicles. And imagination is really having a say here because their GPU has been used in vehicles with that uh, hardware isolation and virtualization to make sure that the dashboard could always be stable and safe, even if the other entertainment systems, the other screens uh, have failed, etc. So the uh, entertainment trend is pretty strong one as well with uh, increasing number of screens, bigger screens, and more flashy, flashy stuff, like a uh, heads-up display mentioned by Denise. It's also a part of the future of AR because it projects some uh, visions in front of your uh, the driver. And another thing also we'd like to mention about is autonomous driving. Its essence, or the first step, is to digitalize the real world or to create a digital version of the real world. And then you can do uh, all the rest of the things, like the radar could start working and the detections and the perceptions, etc. So, which is why the uh, computation power of those car processors are getting better. 500 T flops or even 1000 T flops stacking up these computation power. And when technology matures, when we reach L3, L4 autonomous driving, it will really be the time when we reach a new era. Of course, we cannot reach there without the perfecting of regulations as well. And L5 is still pretty far from us. Well, in the long term, of course, it's going to be achieved, or at least a direction, once we have enough computation power and the technology but with uh, like th the network between connected vehicles, how do they avoid collisions of any kinds? There's supposed to be some sort of uh, standards. Maybe Kronos could consider this as well. Because for two different OEMs, their cars are about to collide. You can avoid that through radar or uh, cameras, etc. But if they follow the, the same connected vehicle standard, maybe they could uh, avoid that in, in a much simpler way. Maybe we can have some common spec to achieve that and create a much better uh, world in terms of transportation. Well, thank you. Well, one of my remaining questions is that maybe different OEMs have different suppliers and they all have their own technical routes and how they're going to talk to each other, their devices, the products. Well, it does need a certain neutral standardization organization that people all recognize so that they all believe in the same technical direction in order for them to follow the same standard. So, Hajo, this is probably not your area. Indeed, not my area, but uh, for the uh, 
infotainment system, as they have already mentioned about those. But I have another point to add here. It's not related too much to the in-cabin uh, experiences, but from uh, digital twin or the external monitoring and operation for autonomous driving. Because when we really reach L4 or L5 autonomous driving, then many of the traditional uh, logistics industry, maybe people don't have to be the driver anymore, but how to monitor and supervise those fleets is going to be an issue. And Digital Twin is a technology right now which to have a complete coupling of the virtual version of real world. And when it comes to the operation and the monitoring of in the vehicle, it's also something that could be fully digitalized in our mon monitoring and operation so that people could uh, uh, monitor and supervise the operation of a fleet remotely and you can be able to see what's happening there in the real world through AR or VR directly observe that rendered virtual world basically 100% reflect the real world I think this is a new angle for uh, autonom autonom uh, automotives and then uh, a new mode of exploration. Okay, thank you. And uh, another question, I'm not sure if you are at convenience to disclose that. Hao Chen, you also know about Stadia. And Feng Lin, you work in Vivo, but you probably know about how Qualcomm have studied that. Dennis, you serve as a bridge between China and uh, the US and the rest of the world. So could you tell us from your perspective in your area of work, the technology of China when compared with uh, other countries, especially US, well, what's the technical progress difference or and what's the trend of development? Could you tell us about that? Okay, just from my own area of work, in Google Stadia, I worked for seven to eight years. Well, Stadia had been existing for that long? Yes. When Stadia, at the earliest time, actually, it was actually, uh, actually kept a secret for three years before telling, it, uh, telling about it to the public. And the technology involvement, one thing which is very different, that whenever Google pushes for something, they always start from pushing it to become an industrial standard. So when Stadia starts, a very clear target at that time is that we'll need to use web because the entire streaming and uh, the technical system could be uh, compatible across different browsers because different browsers, not all of them are controlled by Google. And uh, there are Microsoft, uh, Firefox, and uh, all these browsers are basically use the same standard. So that's a technology from Google. They do need for the low latency because it's going to be used for uh, cloud gaming and they wish all the other browsers in the market could uh, support it be compatible. So they started with a standard. And uh, uh, we worked with Kronos for quite a long time. At that time, I remember Vulkan was uh, just started as a graphic API at that time. And most of the games are still based upon DirectX real-time uh, rendering. And at that time, we believed that OpenGL cannot match the performance of uh, the uh, console APIs. So how do we use maybe an industrial standard to have a better standard and a better C API together and make it popular, penetrate more. So that's the Google's understanding of the issue at that time. Many uh, technical involvements are working towards the direction of becoming an industrial standard. But in China, uh, basically, many people wanted to build something and occupy the market to some extent. 
and then standardize some non-necessary things, but still hold on to the core part as myself. Uh, it's not they're going not going to push it as an open flat platform and for my personal feeling is that the Google's or other foreign companies uh, working method one of the advantages that they can integrate all these top leading companies and experts and uh, push this topic really to an extreme be it performance API standardization it's uh, uh, whether it's reasonable and it's a rev revolutionary changes they are hoping to make for the industry for the better good of the industry uh, and the bigger scales. But in China, I think uh, there is a gap. But the good thing is that the user base is really huge in China. So if you go from the perspective of the uh, iteration towards the user base and uh, you get the feedback and you iterate further, of course, you are stronger in this area. I think that is the uh, difference in respect of uh, technical iteration between China and overseas. So maybe you can talk a little bit, Feng So now I'm in Vivo, so maybe I will talk first about the cell phone market, because uh, now we can see that for the global cell phone market, basically there are the six players, uh, Apple, Samsung, and then uh, Oppo, Vivo, uh, me, and uh, Huawei. Uh, Huawei is a shrinking track. But if we take a look at the market share, Chinese enterprises already are doing quite well. And in respect of experience, I don't know whether you used Vivo before. Well, for Vivo cell phone, like X-Series, the uh, camera, photo, and uh, Roku, uh, the game is really good and uh, they're very good in experience but the issue is Huawei is uh, withdrawing from high-end market so people are always saying okay for the majority of the high-end market they will be taken by Apple and that is the, the problem is not just for Vivo, it's the problem for the industry. How do we do it? Actually, different uh, players had different actions. And for the chips, of course, they play an important part in this. For Huawei, they can make their own chips. Uh, of course, it's not like 100% decisive, but at least that puts a lot of weight here. And for us, we need to think about how we make things work and satisfy the user's need with uh, some unique products. I think that is the target of the domestic players. And it comes back to the chips. So you know that for the chips, uh, due to the trade war, of course, we are limited in a lot of ways. And in respect of the basic capability, uh, of course, compared to the US, we still have some gaps like uh, the IP capability or uh, the bottom layer manufacturing capability, we still need to do more. And we do see other things like uh, we do see the companies like Imagination, uh, who is uh, serving uh, the chip companies in China. I think this is a good example. Chips. Uh, enabled with uh, imagination IP always served uh, a lot of companies in China. I think that is a good trend so that we can have uh, uh, more companies that can provide good stuff and IP capability to China and then maybe we can go further or deeper to like EDA tools or many maybe manufacturers uh, in respect of uh, their uh, process capabilities. So in this area, I think China, we dare not say we will surpass uh, very quick, but uh, we can catch up.
Okay, thank you, Vaughn. So I just want to respond to uh, what you said. You said that uh, for chips, we need the EDA, we need uh, IP. So I talked with a lot of friends, and uh, I mentioned this a lot. I want to repeat it here. So for all of the industry chains, of course, there is the distribution of uh, tasks. I like to coin this uh, uh, example. There is this uh, Nobel Economics Prize uh, winner, and that winner shared a story of a pencil. So. A pencil costs like a 0 0.2 uh, and then it has the graphite, it has uh, the, um, the rubber, it has uh, the uh, metal that binds the rubber and it uh, has the wood. The wood comes from Southeast, uh, South Asia and you need to uh, lumber there and you need the saws and of course it needs steel. So not one company can finish all the links in the industry chain. So in all of the industry, there is the distribution of uh, tasks. So for chips, it's the same thing. It's not like all of the chip companies need to develop from scratch. It's not realistic. And also, in China, the uh, a lot of the chip companies are not that big. Even if for the giants of uh, chip industry, they would not cover the whole industry chain. So, well, I uh, cannot hold it back, so I added something. So, I just gave uh, our company a, an advertisement. So, uh, for a lot of uh, Chinese companies, uh, you have your own IP, I think. The environment puts a lot of, uh, uh, you know, expectation on you, but actually, uh, you know, using uh, others' IP is uh, very, you know, mainstream and it's uh, very common. But people are a little embarrassed to talk about it. So uh, the other thing is that apart from the uh, bottom layer and IP, and also we mentioned the industry standard. So maybe you can talk a little bit from that perspective. Yeah, I think you raised a very good question. So for each uh, company. There is this uh, decision that you need to make, uh, how we go about do it. And uh, our culture is about we need to do our own st stuff and we need to own something. And that was the past. But now a lot of companies don't think like that. But at first, a lot of people would do that. So I spent like uh, 15 years in the US and then I came back to China and I spent another 15 years in the international standard organizations and I observed a lot of things. Actually, in China, we, it's not like we lack a lot of creative ideas. For example, like, uh, but in US, like uh, uh, GLDF or OpenGL or the 3D uh, cloud compression, they all came from small companies, but then they got big. Why? Because you can take a look at their journey. They handed it over to an international standard organization or a small industry organization. Then the uh, industry can help develop the ecosystem. And then they enable full discussion and then the ecosystem established. So uh, you definitely need to revise a lot of things on the original idea. Everybody gets involved. Then, since everybody is involved, then uh, people would tend to agree. Then, of course, there is another participant in the ecosystem. And then finally, the ecosystem gets very big. So there are a lot of good ideas in China. It's just that we don't have the ecosystem. Then there's no development. Then there's no good or bad. Maybe at first, the other idea is not as good as you, but they have the ecosystem. Then they develop to a level when they are better than you. So it's a pity. So now things are changing. A lot of companies in China, they need to decide a lot of things. And uh, they do have a lot of advantage. For example, you need to think about how you choose uh, favorable conditions to you. So uh, for Kelvin, I don't know whether you have anything to add in this area. Well, not, not a lot, but uh, I think I do have some personal experience. I uh, worked in domestic companies and uh, foreign companies. So I think it's like two systems, but 
Why uh, do a lot of Chinese companies want to do it on their own? I think uh, it has something to do with the fast growth of the economy uh, in, in China. Because if you own a certain piece of land, you will definitely get re the return. That is the, the mindset of a lot of Chinese companies. Because in the last 30 years, we had very fast growth. And that nurtured this kind of mindset. But I do see a lot of uh, friends, a lot of entrepreneurs are like the overseas market. They are trying to go deeper in their own stuff. For example, uh, in IP or in GPU or the, the tools. And then based on the tools, they develop a lot of systems. So in the last two years, I found that uh, the market gets more segmented. And due to the COVID and due to the slowdown of the economy, uh, well, it's not like, unlike before, uh, you get into the industry, you get a lot of uh, uh, you know, resource, and then you can benefit from it. So maybe it's about like uh, uh, Meituan or uh, Didi. So they get the market, they will get a lot of ben benefit or profit. Things are not like that before. In the future, more enterprises would try to cooperate, to share, and to focus on their own expertise. Because I do have a lot of friends. You know, in many years, we only focus on our own XR uh, system capability as well as our tools, and we leave the other things to the system partners. And I think they will get better as well. So. I think it has something to do with the economic environment and also has something to do with the economic growth. I personally am very optimistic about this direction because for our colleagues, we do have people that can withstand the loneliness of uh, digging very deep in a certain area. And in such an environment, we can go deeper and create more uh, synergy and coordination. We can uh, enrich the soil better. So I am quite optimistic. So I spent time in a Chinese company and foreign company. I knew about the different styles. But now it's like uh, the styles have changed and merged. And the change is pretty big. So that's what I thought. Okay, thank you, Mr. Tom. Since uh, time is limited, we did discuss a lot of things, but uh, it's like uh, we just touched on the service, but uh, since time is really limited, uh, we don't have time to dig deeper. So before we end, I just want to thank once again the participants online and offline. And just off the top of my head, uh, any questions from the audience for the guests today? So I'm interested in the X2 device. Like Oculus, uh, it needs a long cable. Now, uh, for wireless, uh, can we realize wireless from the hardware perspective, for example, 4K. Uh, if we play a 4K real-time uh, VR video, maybe it's uh, download or maybe it's uh, edge computed and we have this uh, VR headset, maybe we can uh, realize uh, 60 FPS uh, because if it's uh, below uh, 60 FPX, uh, it's hardly uh, 20 millisecond or low. So can we realize that with wireless? Well, I'm um, sure, but uh, currently we can see that if you're talking about Wi-Fi, in the last two years, it's Wi-Fi 6, right? But uh, Wi-Fi 7 will be out pretty soon. And in the latter half of the year, the uh, Wi-Fi 7 cell phone will be out. So, in respect of the speed, uh, I don't think 4K is a problem. And then for Wi-Fi, uh, currently, uh, 
Wi-Fi is multi-frequency, so the stability and anti-interference is uh, a problem because it's not like a cable. Uh, it's a uh, fixed channel, but for wireless, uh, it's, uh, the, the channel is hardly stable. So I cannot answer that right away, but maybe I need to talk with my uh, connectivity colleagues. I don't have the exact number, but in respect of the speed, Wi-Fi can guarantee that. But in respect of the latency, whether that can create a problem, I'm not that sure right now. Maybe uh, we can talk afterwards. So I wanted to ask something for Oculus Quest 2. Uh, they have the uh, Wi-Fi uh, testing version. So with Wi-Fi 6, when the network is stable, the experience is not that problematic. So that's uh, as far as I know. So the, the bigger thing on uh, Wi-Fi is about uh, what you said. It's about the signal. Maybe the signal is not stable, or maybe it, there can be some, uh, you know, uh, blockage, or uh, there can be some uh, uh, drops or the uh, deterioration of the experience. But uh, I think currently it can be done. Okay. So time is limited, so this is the last one. So the question is on ray tracing uh, with the IMG uh, chip, I think. With the imagination, I think there are chips already in cell phone. So on VR, the rendering computing uh, is even more. So the power consumption is higher. For the ray tracing, according to your understanding, when can we enable ray tracing in VR devices? Well, our light, our ray tracing technology, as we introduced in the morning, Christoph mentioned that uh, we have that test chip as early as in 2016, but it wasn't put into mass production because of ecosystem is not prepared for that. No app can use that at that time. And now, according to what we see in software fields, people are paying attention to that, especially games on PC and consoles. Not so many on uh, mobile because people are worried about hardware capacities. But now many mobile game developers are discussing such matters with us. So we're going to see that soon. And for chips, we are... Uh, our IP providers, and we cannot disclose some of our clients' information, but they've already got licensed from our IP, and in the near future, you'll be able to see those chips with ray tracing features inside. And we all use the Kronos standardized APIs, so these chips and the uh, the usage and applications for those wouldn't take very long. So it's going to be in the near future. And as for devices, you are asking, well, it takes some more time because it depends on how the OEMs would like to select and uh, install into their new models, but it's happening. And in actual timeline, it's now not possible to make that guess yet. All right, we do have quite a lot of questions from uh, our audience, but uh, due to our time limitations, we'd have to stop right now. And we still have a uh, lucky draw session. And uh,